Hi everybody, welcome back. Today we are going to look at uh, the design of this board, which I began to populate now. Uh, still missing most sockets here, there, down here, <laughs> down here. Uh, still missing most things. I'm waiting for components to, to arrive. But uh, that's the board uh, whose design we'll be looking at uh, today. It's a two layer board. Uh, not the cheapest because it's uh, a large format, um, but it's only two layers. So let's uh, get stuck right in and have a look at this. But before we get to the to the board itself, I wanted to comment on two comments I received on my last video, uh, episode three, and that's the that's the nice thing about uh, uh, doing this project while making the videos, making the videos as I do it. Because I can get interesting feedback <laughs> before I'm done with the whole thing. There were two excellent comments. Um, the first one, I believe, is by uh, Michelle, um, and it has to do with this chip here. Let me uh, zoom in. The 7400 right here, which is a quad. Uh, let me move myself around. It's a quad um, two input NAND gate. Yeah. And uh, last time I was uh, saying that, okay, by using one of the four NAND gates as an inverter, um, I would have this one signal here, here, uh, RLOE, uh, without a Schmidt trigger input. Um, and Michel reminded me that, hey, there is a quad two input NAND gate, 74 logic, uh, that has Schmidt trigger inputs. It's the 74132. Um, and I got, uh, I'll tell you why I didn't even think of that. I'm trying to stick to the TTL chips that are available in Logisim uh, with this nice chip design here, because if I make my own, it will look like the 245 and you know, an ugly box. Um, so I'm trying to stick as much as possible to what is available in Logisim, because I consider these Logisim models an integral part of the project. Uh, not, not something on the side, but integral to it. It forms the complete uh, educational package. Um, and in, in Logisim, uh, you have the 7400 quad uh, to input an end gate, uh, but not uh, the 132. Um, what we have is the 7424, which is the same. It's a quad uh, to input an end gate with Schmidt triggers, but this one is not made anymore. At least uh, I don't see it available anywhere. There is only new old stock. Um, but one of the criteria of this project is to only use currently manufactured uh, CMOS uh, parts. So I discarded this and I didn't even think about the 132. Now the 132 is not available here. Oh, it is. It no, no, that's, that's the 32. The 74132 is not available uh, here. Um, but the thing is, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I can just keep the 7400 in there because the 74132 is the same chip. It has the same logic, the same pinout, the same package. Uh, so I can keep the model with the 7400. Uh, logically, it's the same thing. And then uh, on, the, on the PCB, uh, it's the same socket, but instead of installing a 7400, I will install a 74132, and we have Schmidt trigger inputs everywhere. That easy. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. The other uh, comment, uh, let me see from whom it was, from Mark Jacobi. Uh, um, his suggestion was an even even simpler thing um, because if you look at this chip here, let me open this up. Um, my face disappeared. Bear with me for a moment. Um, I am using uh, four of the inverters uh, to in invert and uninvert two signals, uh, SNH and SNL, and 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 these inverters do have Schmidt trigger uh, inputs. But his suggestion which is very simple, was uh, use the first inverter for both of these signals, SNL uh, and SNH. But for one of them, instead of taking the second inverter from this chip, uh, use the NAND gate as the second inverter or one of these two signals. And then even if I use a 7400 here, 
I would still have Schmidt trigger inputs for everything. Uh, I should have designed it that way, so it's just my stupidity. <laughs> so cheers uh, to Mark Jacobi, that's, that's the way to go. Um, in this case, I had already designed the PCB, so I would just replace the 7400 for a 74132 uh, because then there is no alteration to the traces on the board. So let's look at uh, the schematics, uh, schematics now uh, in the CAD environment for the PCB. Okay, here's the design. Uh, there are five uh, schematic sheets um, because there are a lot of components. It's not that it's complicated or, any, or anything. Um, I start with this first group of electrolytic capacitors here. These are 100 microfarad um, decoupling capacitors that I will spread around the board. Because this is a two-layer board, I will not be using ground or VCC planes, only ground and VCC copper fills, uh, which are not as efficient as uh, full planes. Um, so I'm over-engineering it when it comes to decoupling. Uh, so nine electrolytics and then one uh, 100 nanofarad a ceramic capacitor for each chip and uh, 9 electrolytics for the whole thing. Uh, this is the power indicators, an LED with a 1K resistor. I may change the value of the resistor if I'm not happy with the brightness of the LED, but it's driven directly from the VCC rail, so it, it, as far as current supply is concerned, it's not a problem. I just don't want to waste uh, too much current. Uh, this is um, the power uh, supply part. Um, I want this board to be powered either from the back plane, 12 volts, or directly from a barrel connector, which is this. This is a center positive barrel connector. I will I'll be configuring it as center positive. Um, and this switch here will basically determine whether I'm power, powering it on from uh, the, the barrel connector as a standalone independent board, a handheld calculator, or in the other position, uh, it will be powered from the back plane. And of course, if it's not connected to the back plane, then the other position is just off. <laughs> it's on and off. Um, so that's the barrel connector, the on-off switch. Uh, this is a transient uh, voltage suppression diode. Just in case suddenly you feed it more than 12 volts, then the excess will be drained uh, to ground via this diode. On the other side, uh, two large decoupling capacitors, in addition to this nine one here uh, that are spread around the board, close to the power supply, there will be a 407 70 microfarad low ESR uh, capacitor um, on the 12 volt uh, line, which is what comes in, uh, and another one immediately after the regulator. So that's another decoupling capacitor, also 470 microfarad low ESR for the 5 volt part. Uh, this is the regulator, it's a switch mode regulator or a DC to DC converter. Uh, it's a track of power, I like to use these a lot, I find them to be very good. Uh, and an extra transient voltage suppression diode for the 5 volt line, just in case suddenly there is more than 5 volts, then the excess will drain to ground through this diode. So that's it for the power supply part, very simple. Now this is for uh, the hand operated clock and reset. Uh, which, of course, is only valid if you're using the board uh, off the backplane. Uh, and and theref therefore, it will not get the clock signal and the reset signal from the backplane, so you have to press uh, uh, push buttons uh, to, to emulate clock and reset. These are the push buttons, uh, this one and this one here. Um, the circuit around them is, is very simple, just a voltage divider here and a timing timer capacitor of 100 nanofarad in both cases. The way it works is the following. Uh, let me see which line this is. I'm not sure whether this is reset or clock, but they are inverted, so we'll find out soon. This is reset. Um, when you turn the computer on, this capacitor will be discharged, so there will be ground potential on this side, so this will be zero. But after a short while, the capacitor will charge through these two resistors here, uh, and then this will be a one. Now, if you press the button, then what you would do, you will connect the two sides of this button here, and then this would, the capacitor will discharge through the 10K ohm resistor to ground. And then this line here will be zero again. Uh, but notice, 
if you press this line will be zero and it will go into this uh, inverter chip which has uh, Schmidt trigger uh, inputs uh, and then it's inverted once and then inverted again so it will be zero again it will go through uh, this transceiver will come out here on A3 and this is the local reset line LN is uh, L for local N for negated because it's active low so that's the local reset line so if you press this button here well, when you turn the computer on, there will be a reset state until this capacitor charges. And after that, if you press the button, this line will go low, it's inverted twice, so it's still low, then it's just buffered, and then it will be low here, and reset is active low. The computer will reset every time you press this button. Now, this here is the opposite. Well, this part of the circuit is identical, but here you see it goes only through one inverter, so it will actually be inverted, because in the case of the clock, uh, uh, I, if I press the button, I want to have a positive transition of the clock because the entire computer is based on, on, on rising edges. Uh, the, 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 the chips are triggered by a clock rising edge. So that's why it's inverted only once. If you press the button, this line will be zero, but after the inverter, it will be one. Then it goes through the buffer, comes out into B2, comes out at A2, and then through a little resistor, you get the local clock. Local clock is the clock signal in this board, in this card, uh, as, as opposed to the clock signal that comes from the back plane. Uh, they can be identical depending on how you configure the board, but uh, for, for schematical, schematics purpose, I have, to, I have to split them. This little resistor here is just because this is the clock line, so it oscillates a lot. Um, and if the rise time and the fall time are very short, in other words, if the clock signal rises very fast, then it will have very rich uh, uh, harmonic content in the higher frequencies. If you do a Fourier decomposition, you will find that you know, the higher frequency components uh, will have a strong contribution to the power spectrum. And, and they are the ones that get um, reflected and induce ringing. So this transistor here is just to uh, filter out the higher frequency components uh, of the signal and reduce ringing. Uh, this resistor together with the parasitic capacitance that will be on the line uh, will work as a sort of a low pass filter. A very tolerating, <laughs> acquiescent low pass filter, but it will reduce ringing. 33 ohms because, uh, you know, uh, um, PCB traces usually have 50 ohm impedance. The output impedance of these chips tends to be 12, 13 ohms. So if you do 33, it's close to 50, so it, you get impedance matching. It's another way of explaining why this thing here absorbs uh, some of the ringing. Now, uh, these two chips here, they are both 245s. Uh, they're just buffers. Um, and I am using them uh, in the following way. Uh, this is the enable signal, AB output enable and switch output enable. Um, they are produced here, AB output enable and switch output enable. And if you notice it, one is the opposite uh, of the other. Uh, because they are inverted, you see AB output enable goes into 3A and come out from, comes out from 3Y. Uh, so one is the opposite of the other, meaning that only one of these two, two chip, chips will be enabled at a time. And this is the way uh, to select whether you want the control signals to come from the back plane. These are the control signals that come from the back plane, including the reset uh, and the clock line. And these are the control signals that come from the board manu manually. You already saw two of them, reset and clock. Uh, but there is also a, a here a um, dip switch. Uh, there are eight switches here. I'm only using five of them. So you can set the other control signals locally on this board if you are using the board in standalone mode as a handheld calculator. This resistor network here is just 10k pull downs uh, to ground, and and that that's how you you use a dip switch one side is vcc that's the com side uh, and the other side is just pulled down to ground uh, if the switch is active uh, then the two sides will be connected and therefore you will get let me see you get vcc uh, because there is a 10k ohm resistor on this side going to ground so you you will get uh, five volts here and this signal will be high 
but on the other position of the dip switch, it will disconnect the comb, the VCC, uh, and therefore you will have ground potential. So this resistor network is just to allow us to use the dip switch to select between high and low VCC or ground uh, to control the other uh, five signals. And again, depending on uh, the setting that comes from this um, header, if you put a shunt, if you don't put a shunt on the header, uh, then you have VCC here through a 10k ohm resi uh, resistor. You have VCC, uh, which then is inverted once and inverted twice and. Um, I have to explain why I'm doing this, but uh, w wait a moment. It's inverted twice, so logically it's the same. So here you will have uh, the output enable for AB, which is basically the stuff that comes from from um, the backplane, AB for, for the two operand registers. Uh, and then it's inverted once again to produce the switch output enable, which is to enable the, the control signals uh, as defined by the dip switches and the buttons. That's all there is to it. Um, I'm using this inverter uh, with Schmidt trigger inputs mainly for these two guys here. Uh, and that's because um, it's part of a normal debouncing circuit. Uh, of course, this RC uh, uh, combination here reduces the oscillation on the line uh, but using a Schmidt trigger gate is, is the correct way to do a proper debouncing circuit otherwise when you press the button the signal will go up, up and down during a fraction of a second until the, the connection is actually made or undone um, and to prevent that bouncing around of the signal uh, we use this uh, Schmidt trigger input inverter as, as part of the debouncing circuit on the, in the case of these two and in the case of this, yeah, it's because I just have the inverter there anyway, so I can boost the signal <laughs> and really filter out a little bit of the interference. So why not? That's, so that's it. That's the, the circuitry for determining the control signals, whether they come from the backplane or are generated locally. And these are just the two backplane connectors. I studied the distribution of the signals across the two connectors. I have many more uh, lines than I need. Um, um, and I studied the distribution to facilitate routing uh, and you may think well a lot of unused lines here with the little green cross uh, they are unused by this board but uh, the other cards will use these lines um, and I want each card to be able to be connected in any place I don't have a I don't want to have a dedicated slot for the ALU card and a separate dedicated slot for the register file I want you to be able to plug each card anywhere on the backplane because depending on the card that you want to watch in operation you may want to put that first so you can see the LEDs better or whatever <laughs> or to prevent mistakes um, so the other signals will be used by the other cards and th there are more than enough uh, uh, pins available on the backplane so now we go to the next sheet and uh, that's the operand sheet uh, those signals to select whether you get uh, uh, signals from the dip switches or from the backplane are still there ABOE and SWOE you see them everywhere you see for each of these four sub-circuits uh, you can make the option you can make the choice and if you've chosen uh, to use the circuit uh, locally then ABOE will be active or low and these are the signals that come from the backplane B high 0 to B high 7, A high 0 to A high 7 and then the same thing for B low and A low and you have the four operands. Uh, on the other hand if you uh, have SWOE active and you want the signals to come from the BIP switches then it's this buffer that will be enabled the other one will be twice stated so the signals that go here uh, will be coming from this buffer which ultimately come from the dip switch. So there are four dip switches, so you can set the operands, uh, any one of the operands locally on the board, like you were operating, uh, as if you were operating a hand calculator, except that this is a binary based hand calculator. There is no conversion to decimal or hexadecimal. And then the same resistor networks there to pull the signals down to ground, so you can properly, properly use the dip switches. That's all there is to it. And uh, you see, this, these are the same signals. Oops. Um, it's just uh, B high zero. Uh, here, it's still B high zero, but I just add the S selected. B high selected zero. Because this is after the selection between these two buffers here. Same for the other A high, uh, A high selected, B, B low selected, and A low selected. 
Um, now we go to the indicators, which is just the LEDs in the driver circuits to show uh, what the signals are, whether they come from the dip switches or from the back plane, these LEDs will light up and tell you uh, what the four operands are. So this is a high uh, after selection already, this is B high, this is A low and B low, and the LEDs uh, are driven uh, by their own 245s. So there is a separate buffer to drive the LEDs alone and the output of that, that buffer is not used as a logic signal. It's used only to drive the LEDs, but I still use uh, resistor networks here of 1K. So these are just eight 1K resistors uh, in parallel, side by side, uh, to reduce the current drain before uh, you get to the LEDs. Uh, 1K, you know, I'm using five volts, so these will be five volt signals. 1K gives me five milli milliamps, uh, which is more than enough to light up a modern LED and make it visible. And, and you don't want to pull more current out of a 74 logic chip, five milliamps. It, 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 it's okay. <laughs> it shouldn't go much beyond that. If you go much beyond that, it will work for a while. <laughs> it, uh, it's the risk you, 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 you run. It's not the right way to do it. You do put a current limiting uh, resistor uh, in between. This is the arithmetic proper. Um, these are the XOR gates that invert the signal if we want to... Oh, not, not this one in the middle. So it's... Uh, minus this. Um, uh, in case you're doing a subtraction you, or you want to, you, in case you're doing a subtraction you use these XOR gates to invert uh, one of the operands. Uh, and these are the ALU chips themselves. We've looked at all this in the previous episode, I'm not going to repeat the explanation. And these two are the control chips. Notice that here I already have the 74HC132 which is the quad uh, to input NAND gate chip with Schmidt trigger uh, input. So I already changed it here in the schematics. Now, uh, how they are connected, it's just, I just imported the netlist from the simulation tool. I didn't rethink the logic at all. I just went about connecting whatever two pins were connected uh, in the simulation circuit. Unfortunately, there is no automatic export of the netlist. I had to do it by hand. Uh, so I did it once to connect everything and then I went over everything again to cross check. Is it guaranteed there are no errors? Not at all. <laughs> the board I am assembling right now that I just showed you may very well have errors. I have been known. <laughs> to make errors uh, when I'm connecting things, uh, you know, my, my attention goes low very quickly when I get into a part of the process that, it's not, that is not creative anymore. That sort of automatic stuff, you know, just connecting lines and I'm not thinking about the logic anymore. I, I've been known to make mistakes when I get into this more non-creative parts of the process. So we'll, we'll see. If it doesn't work, a respin is not too expensive. It's a two layer board. Now that's the flags logic. I didn't show it in the simulator. I forgot to simulate this whole, I mean, the simulator sh does show the flags, but not with all the electric precautions that one needs to take. This you've seen in the simulator. These are the four logic chips that check uh, whether the operands are zero. So this is just, you know, check zero for result high and check if zero for result low. That's all there is to it. Um, and the other inputs that go into this uh, uh, register, this is a 74273, it's just a register, it has eight flip-flops inside, that, that, that's all there is to it. The other signals going into it, um, of, of course you, you need to have the, the, the clock and the reset, <laughs> you, you always need to have them, but the other signals are for instance uh, ALU7 which is just the sign bit low, um, then you have uh, AL, uh, this is ALU low 7 and ALU high 7, the seventh uh, uh, bit or the most significant bit of the high part of the ALU and that's just a, a sign flag high. <laughs> um, and then you also have uh, the carry low and the carry high which come straight from, from the arithmetic. They come from somewhere here. Uh, where are they? Here, this is the carry high and this is the carry low. So you just wire them 
straight uh, into the flags register. And then uh, here the same story, uh, the output of the flags register is buffered by a 245 uh, before it goes back into the backplane, so it can be used by the control logic in another card. Um, and through a different buffer, so we don't take signals from that, that are driving an LED to drive a logic signal, so uh, through a different buffer and through another current lim limiting resistor network with 1K resistors, eight of them in parallel, uh, you light up the eight LEDs, or in this case the six LEDs because there are only six flags, you light up the six LEDs so you can see on the board which flag is active and which flag is not active. And this is the result logic. Well, here on the side, very conspicuously, you have the oops, what have I done? You have the other uh, uh, decoupling capacitors. This, the, this is these would be more normally called bypass capacitors. You know, th th there is no, as far as I know, there is no you know specific rule to discern decoupling from bypassing. But if you look at the usage, how people use the terms. Decoupling is usually for uh, eliminating uh, this low frequency noise from the power rails. Decoupling capacitors are us usually electrolytic capacitors with high capacitance value, usually close uh, to the power supply. Um, and bypass capacitors, uh, they are to remove the, the, the higher frequency uh, harmonics from the power rail and they are usually placed very close to the chips they are supposed to bypass. Uh, so usually you have one bypass cap, a small ceramic capacitor of uh, 100 nanofarads, very close to each one of the chips. Now, uh, these are just two 8-bit registers. They contain the results, result high and result low. Uh, these lines come from the ALUs, which compute uh, the results. And then, of course, you have reset and clock, local reset and local clock, because, you know, you. Uh, this, this signal may come from the back plane if you're using the thing, the carding system, or from the push buttons if you're using the card in standalone mode. And then the same story. Before they are driven back into the back plane, you have to buffer them. Um, it, I always recommend that, uh, you know, if you're going to drive a signal through a back plane, you buffer them just before they enter the back plane to make sure they have enough drive uh, uh, to, to, to go through long traces, through the backplane connectors themselves. Uh, so these two buffers here are the ones that drive the signals back into the backplane. They go to the internal bus high and internal bus low, respectively. And here again, again, I am using 33 ohm resistors uh, to reduce ringing. And why am I doing this here? Because this is the internal bus. So these are lines with very large fan out these traces will have lots of branches um, it, so it, it, the chance that there will be a lot of ringing because there will be a lot of reflections a lot of impedance mismatches uh, is pretty high so you want to do something to sort of compensate for that uh, and and adding the 33 ohm uh, resistors uh, do help reduce ringing so these are again resistor networks eight resistors in parallel each one of them 33 ohms, and then the lines go into the internal bus, internal bus high and internal bus low uh, through the backplane. And there's a separate buffer to drive, again, resistor networks, but in this case, 1K ohm, and these are now not to eliminate uh, uh, ringing. These are to reduce the current drain from the buffer uh, as the signal drives uh, the eight LEDs. Uh, that uh, will show you the value of a result high and the eight LEDs that will show you the value of result low. And that's it. That's it as far as the schematics are concerned. Okay, here is the PCB now. So we've seen the schematics and I used those schematics to build this PCB. Uh, there are only two layers, uh, top layer uh, in red and bottom layer in blue. They have copper fills. Uh, the top layer is filled with a VCC copper and the bottom layer is filled with ground copper. So VCC in red, ground in blue. In blue. Uh, of course, the copper fills make it very difficult to, to, to see the traces on the board. So I'm going to temporarily delete them so we can see better. So that's the VCC fill from the top layer. It's now gone. And then we just delete the VCC fill from the bottom layer. And then what you notice is that uh, now we have rat lines 
uh, that's the system telling us, oh, you haven't connected uh, the, the ground and VCC uh, uh, rails, uh, which we haven't because they were connected via the, the copper fills. So what we're going to do is we're going to go here to design manager and open the nets and just say, I don't want to see the red lines for ground in VCC. So now we are back in business. So forget the connections from ground and, and VCC. Um, the board design is pretty typical uh, of earlier times when people had to design boards that had only two layers. Uh, they couldn't sandwich cores together very easily. It was very expensive. So people restricted themselves to two layers. Um, and in those cases, when you have to route even ground and VCC, which are very, very long nets, because every chip needs ground, every chip needs VCC. If you pull things up or down, they have more ground than VCC. Those two nets tend to be the most difficult to route um, because they have such enormous fan outs. Um, and if you don't have a ground and VCC plane in the middle layers to route those, um, then you have to observe certain, you know, a certain process to be able to fit everything into only two layers, including ground and VCC nets. And that's what they used to do in the past. Um, and the basic uh, approach is the following. You choose a dominating direction for each of the layers in such a way that the dominating direction of one layer is perpendicular or orthogonal to the dominating direction of the other layer. So in this case, the dominating director direction for the top layer is vertical. It's uh, bottom to top, top to bottom. Now, notice that here I do, I do violate that rule, but I violate it here because I know I can. <laughs> I know I will not run into trouble if I do it here. Uh, and there is a reason I wanted to, to do it. These are the operand lines that come from the back plane. You see, they go into the 245 uh, buffers, which are here. Um, so these are long traces. They are already coming from the backplane connectors, which is already an impedance uh, mismatch. So I didn't want to change layers for these input signals uh, 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 before they got to the respective buffer. I wanted to route them in a single layer to as much as possible avoid more impedance mismatches. When you change layers through a via, that's a big impedance uh, mismatch uh, right there. Uh, you have, may have issues with r return path currents. Um, so I wanted to keep these traces in a single layer until getting to the buffers. And then after the buffers, then it's a different story. But anyway, the dominating direction is vertical for the top layer. And for the bottom layer, the dominating direction is horizontal. Uh, there are two reasons for this. There is a theoretical reason that's not really a very important reason and that is if you keep the signals uh, perpendicular to one another across the two layers uh, there will be less uh, e less crosstalk across the layers because otherwise you may have a trace on the top layer that's right on top of a trace on the bottom layer that follows it if the traces follow one another uh, then you get uh, um, crosstalk they will latch onto one another they will they will couple to one another that is a factor, but usually that's a factor in higher speed boards. This board will be single digit megahertz if I'm lucky. Um, the other reason is very practical and it's very important. Um, you will have a lot of difficulty routing the signals if you don't obey this rule of thumb of a dominating direction. Um, because you, you may, yeah, how do I explain that? It's some, something you understand by doing. Uh, if you don't obey this rule, you will face route, routing dilemmas that will not have a clean solution. You have to pop 10 vias, uh, which is horrible, uh, in order to route something. But if you keep the signals from surrounding the point where you want them connected by maintaining a dominating direction that is different across different layers, uh, you will not run into huge routing issues because you don't encircle something. Suppose that uh, you want to connect to this pin and if you encircle it horizontally and vertically uh, with blue lines and you're doing the same thing on the other side, then it may be, may be impossible to route uh, the signal. So you avoid 
circumstances where you cage in a pin uh, if you observe this rule of thumb of the dominating direction. You will not cage a pin. You will not make the pin inaccessible. You may have to drop vias. There are lines here in which I dropped two or three vias, uh, which is a no-go for a high-speed board. But again, this is single-digit megahertz, uh, so a few vias are okay. Uh, and you can clearly see, especially in this view here, that uh, you know in red, dominating direction is vertical, and in blue, dominating direc direction is horizontal. They would get some diagonals here, some diagonals there. That's okay, especially using modern tooling. In the old days, they didn't have tooling like this. Um, they would often, back in the 70s, they would draw this on paper, uh, and then it's much more difficult to make corrections and try different things. So they would not even do the diagonals. They would keep everything really Manhattan style, you know, just a checkered board, um, and then just drop the vias where they need them to be. Uh, that guarantees that you can find a solution without having to, you know, uh, 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 rub things off a million times and start over a million times. Because when you're doing that on paper, it's a different business than to start over 10 times on, on a CAD tool on your computer. And you start over 10 times in about five minutes. Uh, back in the day, it would be five days. Um, so this is not strict Manhattan, doesn't need to be with modern tooling, but you can clearly observe the dominating direction. And the way this flows is the following. These are the four operand lines, the four operand registers. So four times eight, 32 lines. Uh, they go to the respective buffers, which are along uh, this line here. This is the buffer that drives the LEDs. No, uh, this, let me see. Yeah, this is the buffer for um, the dip switch. This is the dip switch. This is the resistor network next to the dip switch. And this is the buffer that drives the output of the dip switches. Same thing here. Uh, resistor network, dip switch, and the buffer that drives uh, uh, um, the, dip, the signals coming out of the dip switches. Uh, this structure here, you see this structure repeated uh, four times. Here is it again, and then it's again here. And finally, it's here again. It, it's the same structure. It's one for each of the four operands, A high, uh, B high, A low, B low. So this is the buffer for the dip switch signal. This is the buffer for the signals coming from the backplane, which are these ones, he these ones here. You see, they go here all the way up, get into this buffer. And then uh, depending on whether you selected local use or, or in-system use, either this buffer or this buffer will drive the lines that go to the ALU proper. There is an extra buffer here that through a resistor network of 1K drives uh, the LEDs to show you each of the four operands. So you have four sets of eight LEDs, each set for one operand. The signal then goes uh, to, uh, you see it, it, uh, the, these blue lines here, uh, these are the operand signals going to the ALU proper. Uh, these initial four chips are the, not this, are the XORs. These four are the ALUs. These two, the, uh -huh. this and this are the control control chips, the, the four and end gates and the inverter. Uh, these two are to check if the high operand is zero. These two check if the low result operand is zero. And then you have the result registers, uh, result high and result low. Uh, there are dedicated buffers to drive LEDs that show the results and they are driven through uh, these resistor networks uh, of 1K for current limiting. They also go to separate buffers that drive the internal buses again through resistor networks of 33 ohms to reduce ringing and then they go into the back plane. That's about it. <laughs> now these are the, this is the, the part of the circuit. Let me zoom in in here. That's an inverter we've seen before. These are the two uh, push buttons, uh, the four resistors and the two capacitors uh, for debouncing and of course this inverter is part of debouncing. Uh, 
This is a set, an, another dip switch for the control signals. There are five of them. Uh, remember, set negative high, set negative low, set full width, and uh, uh, result low output enable and result high output enable there. You can see them in the silk screen here. You see, they are all marked in the silk screen. These three go unused. Um, and once you've set uh, the dip switches, uh, the signals are driven uh, by these two buffers. They are U39 and U38. If we go back, let me go back to remember which ones they are. I think they are these two here. Yeah, U38 and U39. So those are the two buffers. One buffers the signals coming from the back plane, and the other buffers the signals coming from the dip switches. So they are these two buffers here. One for the dip switches, the other one for the signals coming from the back plane, and they come from the back plane through these lines. If you follow these lines, they are these lines here, you see? They come all the way down he from here. These are the control lines coming from the back plane. So depending on which of these two buffers is active, only one will be active at a time, the other one will, will be tri-stated, then you will drive the ALU proper, this circuitry here in the middle, either through the control lines that come from the back plane, uh, which ultimately come from the control card, which I haven't shown you yet, or from uh, uh, the dip switch uh, in here. And down here, it's the power supply circuit. Uh, we have a switch. Uh, the output of the switch is the middle uh, pad in here, in the middle. Uh, depending on the position of the switch, you connect the middle pad either to the pad on the left, and that's power from the back plane. That's uh, BP VDD or backplane VDD, that's 12 volts coming from the backplane. Or in the other position, you connect the middle to this uh, uh, pad here, which comes from a diode. And this diode is there just as a protection in case you mistakenly use a barrel connector that is uh, center negative instead of center positive. This diode will prevent damage to the circuit. After the diode, you see this trace comes from the barrel connector. So that should give you the 12 volt line. Uh, from the barrel connector in case you're not connecting this card to the back plane but you want to use it as a handheld calculator then that's where the power will come from you have to connect uh, power through the barrel connector here um, and then this is the result it goes through this trace into our DC to DC converter uh, which can accept either 9 volts or 12 volts I recommend 12 volts um, because there will be three or four cards plus the back plane. So, you know, power supplies um, are usually this, this cheap power supplies are currently limited. Um, so you use nine, if you use nine volts for the same power, you will pull more current out. If you use 12 volts for the same power, it will pull less current out. So that's why I recommend 12 volts, but nine volts would do too if your power supply can uh, manage the current. Um, and then the output uh, is the 5 volt line, uh, which goes through this uh, um, uh, transient uh, voltage protection diode. That's the 5 volt one. There is another one here for the 12 volt line. As you see, it connects straight to the barrel. If you connect to the back plane, then I don't worry about this level of protection because the back plane will be protected. I need to protect it on the card itself. Uh, and then goes through a main decoupling capacitor, 470 microfarad. There is another one on the 12 volt side. So there is one on the 12 volt side and one on the 5 volt side. Then there is another 100 uh, nanofarad uh, uh, decoupling here. And then the power is distributed to the, to the rest of the circuit. Um, one final comment I want to make, you may think, why am I already going for manufacturing a card before I complete the overall design? Um, have I completed the overall design, the instruction set architecture, and all the control signals and the pipeline registers? No, <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> um, the reason I'm going quickly for a first manufacturing run is that uh, I want to get a very quick feeling for whether the way I'm laying out these boards uh, will do, will operate well. 
uh, want to do some measurements of signal integrity, of signal integrity, all, all the aspects of signal integrity, to make sure that certain choices I, are, I made uh, will work fine. Like for instance, these control lines here, you see how long these traces are? Now, the, this, this, you know, this, this is about 30 centimeters, each of these traces here. That's pretty long. Um, so I want to check if this kind of arrangement that I assume it is okay, you know, putting the operands vertically here on the side, cascading from right to left, and then going back down, uh, are the trace length is, lengths okay? Uh, the fact that it's a two-layer board, um, you know, I hardly ever made two-layer boards. Uh, they're, they're, they're terrible. Usually you want, you know, ground and VCC planes, and, and there are all kinds of things you can do in a multi-layer board that you can't do in a two-layer board. Um, I tried to get around some of the issues, um, which I should show you once I put the, the copper fill back. But before I get to that, uh, I tried to get around some of the limitations of a two-layer board using certain techniques that I will show you shortly. Um, but I want to see if they are enough. <laughs> so that's why I am quickly going for manufacturing the first card before I start designing the other cards. I want to get quick feedback on whether my choices are okay. That's the reason. Now let me put the copper fills uh, back and then I will show you the final part of you know the, the stuff I did to try to manage signal integrity. Okay, the copper fields um, are back. Um, first thing to notice is that I tried to fill every space with copper. Um, sometimes this has a side effect that is not welcome. Let me show you one instance. For instance, here, this line here, it's not a trace, it's just copper fill. See, it, it ends here. Um, and this is not nice. I would prefer there to be empty space between uh, this trace and this trace, and not copper fill. And the reason is um, this copper fill in between the traces actually facilitates crosstalk. It makes crosstalk more likely. If you run uh, a, a simulator based on Maxwell equations and look at the field fringes, you see that this trace will couple more to this trace if there is floating metal fill. Why, and why am I saying that it's floating? This is VCC, it's connected to VCC. True, um, but I don't have a VC, VCC plane underneath in order to stitch uh, this line here uh, every few centimeters. So for the higher frequency harmonics, this line is basically floating. Uh, the, the thing will, hap will work as if it were floating for the, for the very highest uh, ha frequency harmonics in the, in the hundreds of megahertz uh, um, band. And so I can't stitch this. I don't have an underlying plane to stitch, stitch it to. Uh, the underlying plane is ground. It's not VCC. <laughs> it's not a plane. It's the copper fill underlying it. But I decided I will bite this bullet and I will let this happen. It happened only in a couple of times. I just showed you one. Uh, only in a couple of other places it happened in this here. It happened again. This thing here in the middle. This is not a trace. This is a trace. This is a trace. In the middle is just artifact of copper fill. So I accepted that and I tried to fill copper everywhere. And the reason is I want to try to get this board as close as possible to a board that actually has ground and VCC planes. So I'm using the copper fill as, as though they were planes to get that capacitive coupling between the top layer and the bottom layer that improves bypassing. Um, it, it, this board will basically be one large capacitor with one plate on VCC and the underlying plate on ground and the two plates very close together. What do you call that? That's a capacitor, a distributed capacitor, and that should improve bypassing. So I decided to sacrifice uh, signal integrity in a couple of places uh, to improve bypassing everywhere. That's at least the theory. Uh, some of these connections here, for instance, this, um, these two lines here, they are not traces. I'm adding them just to connect VCC here to VCC there on top and enable copper fill everywhere. Now, notice that for every signal via, for instance, this is a signal via. You see this signal comes from this, uh, this pad 
into this trace here, then through that via, and then on the back of the board, you can see it, uh, you can see through the red, on the back of the board, the signal goes to this pin, see from the back of the board. So this is an actual signal. Next to every signal via, I put a ground via, and that's for return path. Remember, every electrical connection, every electronic signal, every logic signal, is in fact a tiny little transmission line. Every time you send voltage somewhere, uh, current has to return, because every electric circuit is a closed loop. Even your logic signals are transmission lines that have to be closed loops. Um, so when the voltage goes, current comes back from somewhere. If you don't give it a clean path to come back to ground, it will find a path, it will spread itself across the board uh, and interfere with other things. So to prevent that, I tell it where to come back from. I put a ground via right next to it and I'm telling the return current that's where you should go to ground right next to where you come from so you don't spread around and interfere with the other signals. So you see there, this is a signal via here, that's the signal and there is a return path via next to it. Same thing here, signal via and a return path via next to it, signal via and a return path, signal via and a return path. And these other vias here, they are stitching. Um, stitching in the sense that I'm not, I'm not connecting them to a plane, there is no plane, but I'm connecting copper fill to copper fill. So there, this is VCC copper fill here, VCC copper fill there, uh, and they are connected via the back of the board through these two vias here. And the reason is some of these VCC fills are isolated, they are islands. This one in particular is an island, you see it goes there, goes there, 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 and uh, that's it, it's an island. So it would, uh, the tool would not fill it in with copper uh, uh, at VCC if it cannot bring VCC there, and there would be a hole here uh, in the copper fill. To prevent that hole, I put a veer on this copper area and then connect them via the back of the board to this, and then everything gets filled. And other than that, it's the usual stuff. The little bypass capacitors as close as possible to the chips that they are uh, 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 filtering the, the power rails for. Um, you try to make um, the lines as short as possible. In this case, this rule is almost forgotten because I'm trying to optimize for different things. So you have these very long lines here and it's impossible to keep them short when you're using discrete because signals have to go everywhere. It's lots of chips. I will look at the signal integrity of this board, if it works, uh, and, and see if it's okay to use these long lines. But if you can, keep the line short. Uh, don't do four, uh, 90 degree bends. <laughs> this is not too important for a slow circuit like this. You know, it's not high speed board. But try to do f two turns of 45. Now 45 here and then 45 again, instead of 90 degrees, because a 90 degrees bend uh, has some impedance mismatch because the thickness of the trace changes across the, the, the 90 degree bend. It changes across a 45 degree bend also, but less. <laughs> so you're better off with two 45 degree bends than one 90 degree uh, bend. This is not too important. Everything else I said is more important than this, but if you can, why not? You know, your board will look better. You avoid people on the internet saying, oh, no, you, put a, you put a 90 degree bend in there, you ignorant. <laughs> you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> um, and then uh, these decoupling capacitors of 100 microfarad, I just try to distribute them across the copper uh, fills, so they are they are sort of you know, the, the way these work is they're, they're sort of local little recharging batteries to provide power. Uh, to the uh, chips in its neighborhood in case the chips cannot drain power all the way from here fast enough. You know, if there is a lot of switching activity and the power has to come from, from here, from, from, from here, from the regulator, and the regulator is very far away from this chip here, for instance, yeah, uh, the power may not get there by the time you are doing the next switch. 
uh, switching of the signal from zero to one, one to zero. So you put these little batteries around, distributed around, so there is a sort of a local reserve of power closer by. And then with this little bypass, 100 nanofarad capacitors very close to the chips, that, that completes uh, um, the treatment of your power distribution network or PDN. I had a teacher back in the early 90s used to say, uh, not in English, but using all the language, the translation would be, he would say, thou shall reduce the impedance of the PDN. <laughs> it was one of his commandments. Um, and one of the ways to reduce the impedance of the power distribution network is by you know, distributing higher value decoupling capacitors and then even lower, lower value bypass capacitors across the board close to where power is needed. This is it guys, this is it. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, I will now go ahead and tomorrow, if I get to the components, I'll finish populating the board. I'll test it, I will film it. <laughs> uh, I'll make the measurements uh, that are needed and then I will come back and report to you and show you the board, show you it working or not working. <laughs> uh, we will see. All right, I'll see you next time. Take care.